so so I'll just be very brief. And um, so the key thing to remember is that, uh, I'm sure all of you know this, the glucose transporters are in the tumor. The FDG glucose is very much like your routine glucose. It goes inside, gets metabolized by all the enzymes that you're very familiar with. But unfortunately, after the first pass, after being metabolized by or phosphated by the exokinase, it gets trapped. It cannot be metabolized further. So that's how, that's how you image this. Normal structures can light up, including brown fat in the shoulders. And, um, and also, quite often, I'm sure you've seen in the reports, the colon, uh, parts of the colon would light up if there is a mild inflammation. And the, the, the important point I want to make is that the SUV is not as hard uh, reproducible measures as you would think. It is reproducible in the, in, the, in the right setting, right situation, when things are standardized between patients. But, but uh, there are many ways it can go wrong. Essentially, not go wrong, it can be misinterpreted. You actually put a region of interest and see how much of the uptake there compared to the total uptake, and that's the formula they use, and it has to be corrected for the body weight, glucose, etc. So this, depending on the where you put your cursor, the region of interest, the numbers can vary. So just be careful about over-interpreting this, and a lot of different things can affect the SUV. These are the few things, interval after injection, how well it's injected, the size of the region of interest, the resolution of the scanner, glucose, and all these things. That's, that's the basic thing I want to talk about, that the SUV is not a measure that you could really take it. Um, you, you can use it in the, in the correct context, though. You know, if the SUV is above two and a half or three, that could likely be malignant, so you can pursue that. And as many of you know, there could be some tumors like DAC or a mucin secreting tumors that may not light up on the PET scan. And there are false positives through granulomas that I'm sure you're very well aware of. But my big bone of contention is over-interpreting SUV, like a change of SUV from 14 to 16, it's like going from a PSA of 85,000 to 89,000. So I'm not sure whether it really helps us a whole lot. Quite often I see changes are being made in treatment because SUV went from 14 to 18. So I just would caution you from keeping that in mind. I'm not here to bash PET scan. In fact, to be honest with you, I think the PET scan is a fabulous test because it's a great metabolic investigation to the tumor metabolism. And in fact, there have been some papers, we and others have done this and reported before, the baseline SUV can even tell you how the patients uh, do, do well because the highly metabolic tumors are the ones that are rapidly growing and those patients may not necessarily do well. Literally every small cell lung cancer anybody has ever studied is very pet avid. That shows once again the rapidly growing tumors and I don't think we really fully harness the FD, FDG PET scan's potential. But the problem is PET scan is too good of a task and we may overinterpret this and we just simply don't have very many things we can do just by knowing that somebody's progressing a few days early. And as Alan showed you, that they not can identify the uh, patients who would do well in a limited setting. I don't think we have really studied this. And if you really look at the number of phase three studies where the tumor responses were assessed solely by the PET scan, I would say that it's zero to the best of my knowledge. And um, this is actually a real patient of mine. And right now I'm struggling with this patient. So. Uh, this is a gentleman who we treated about eight years ago with uh, left pneumonectomy, if I'm not mistaken, and um, who, had, who did very well after chemotherapy, radiation treatment, and uh, had a single relapse in the brain about uh, five or six years ago, and was doing very well, coming and seeing on a routine basis. We found a few nodules. We did a PET scan. There you see it, spleen and something in the paraspinal region and lymph nodes. And for a good measure, he has a few axillary lymph, inguinal lymph glands. And um, so we actually thought he was having recurrent disease. So he was feeling so good. And I didn't want to take that, obviously, at a face value. I did a biopsy, not one. Two different sets of biopsy, one from the mass that you see, one from the inguinal node, complete excision, but we saw only this, just granulomas. And his original tumor had the ROS1 um, positive tumor, ROS1 translocation, but, but he has, is absolutely asymptomatic. The, I have not been able to show that he has 
malignancy and the PET scan looks this hard. And in fact, the two places we biopsied were red hard. In fact, the one you see on the back of this, on the front of the spine is what we biopsied. And um, so it shows granulomatous lesions. So PET scan can be quite um, misleading. And um, so the argument for not doing PET scan every six weeks are the following. One, the SUV is not very dependable within that range I talked about from 18 to 20. And, and to be honest with you, chemotherapy seldom brings it down to benign range. Doing it in patients after chemo radiation is one thing. Even that, we don't know fully how to interpret that. There was an RTOG study done a while ago where patients got a PET scan after 12 or 16 weeks after completion of chemo radiation to ask the question whether post-therapy PET scan done 12 weeks or 16 weeks after treatment would predict the overall outcomes. And I've not seen the results of that study. And um, so that could help us on how to use PET scan in stage three setting. In stage four setting, I prefer to use CT scans to avoid this overinterpretation, avoid the confusion created by these changes in the PET scan and the interpretation by the overenthusiastic or cautious radiologist. And I also would remind you that we have not had any drugs approved based on the um, PET scan criteria, it's all based on the CT scan criteria. And finally, that's the most important argument I would make, that there's no hurry to switch them over to an ineffective salvage therapy when they're doing reasonably well on the current therapy. So that's the main thing I just want to impress upon the audience on these things. Uh, and I would stop here. Thank you very much.